you're not hearing about them from the corporate media. You're not hearing about it from politicians, but you are hearing about it on X because X is a place where free speech can be. There was a stabbing, a, a terrible stabbing, and the culprit has not been fully identified. And so finally, these, these native Englishmen seem to have had enough. This is a clash of cultures. It's not just a clash of religious perspectives. This was going to be another October 7th. That's what they were trying to do. It was an Austrian October 7th. And so what we're seeing is that in America, in France, in, in England, in the rest of Europe, Islam is not playing well with these Western values, and it doesn't intend to. Hello, and welcome to the Pop Culture Contrarian podcast with Thomas Sterling and Andrew. Hello. Hey, everybody. Our topic today is a little bit more on the serious side. It is the assault on free speech and the West's Islam problem. So there's a lot of ground to cover here, but let's start with something we covered a couple weeks back. We talked about GARM, the Global Alliance for Responsible Media. Is that what it is? That's right. And it's about advertising, I guess. It's run Uh, by the World Federation of Advertisers. Which is run by the World World Economic Economic Forum. Forum. Ooh, the big, like the Bond villain. Well, it's Bond villains all the way (laughs) down or up, whichever way you look at it. (laughs) Yeah, it's the real Bond villains. Right. Mm -hmm. Sail on a boat fit for a Bond villain. Sometimes you need to play the part, right? Well, yeah, meeting in Davos, Switzerland. I mean, it doesn't get much more Bond villainy than that. I want to see the tower. Right. <laughs> They've got to have a tower, yeah. you know, and very, one of those, one of those Alpine, uh, runways where you yep. drive off a cliff and then fly. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. For hundred sure. percent. <laughs> okay. Uh, so these people are <laughs> evil. That's They're really what evil. they are. Evil. A young Jedi named Darth Vader, who was a pupil of mine until he turned to evil. They, they pulled all the advertisers from pretty much every company you can think of off of Twitter back when Elon bought them, and they've done a bunch of other stuff. They've tried to suppress the Daily Wire. They've, I mean, it's probably affected us, even in our humble little... uh, Well, it has, not in the same way, because we don't take advertising Mm -hmm. at the Patriot Post, but it has insofar as the mechanisms that they use to identify the organizations that they are not going to support. Yeah. And that's fact-checking organizations, things like NewsGuard or USA Today, just to name a couple... All the social media platforms Mm -hmm. cooperate with this kind of stuff. The big tech Googles, you know, of the internet do this kind of stuff to determine, all right, who's the next target? Right. And that down the list, it includes us. Yeah. Here at the the Patriot Post. And you you mentioned NewsGuard and NewsGuard does collaborate with him. It's kind of like they're, they're using this system to create a rating based social credit score yeah, yeah. for yeah. companies or something like that. And if you, if and they've you, been trying this for a while, that's what the ESG yeah. scores were about of right. environmental, so social and yeah. governance. So it's wrapped in the guise of being something that's for benefiting society. Right. That's and, always what they say. Right. And so they say with GARM, what their tagline effectively was, is we're working to look out for your company so that you don't end up advertising on platforms that would, where someone's going to say a wrong thing. Well, the way they put it is a safe, safe places to advertise where you're not going to offend people. Right. I'm offended, Kim. And then, and then they would use the most extreme examples. Like you don't want to have your ad going on a site that has child pornography. Or right. Or, like or actual neo-Nazism. Or whatever, right. Yeah. Something, something highly offensive, which yeah. Then they it, then <laughs> dilute what highly offensive means down to if you believe men can't become women, right. you're highly offensive. Yeah, at face value, it seems responsible. Well, it's a way of saying, hey, this is hard to look out for potential bombs or, mm-hmm. or lack of a better term there, for companies that are trying to expand their brand and get their, you know, the whole thing about advertising is you're trying to get your product in front of as many people as possible yeah. so that you expand your revenue. And what they kind of did was say half of the audience we don't need. Yeah. What they said was what they did was they were very opaque about what their standards were. They were, they were some very subjective standards and then they're not sharing those standards clearly with all the companies involved. Like what are the rules here? What are the things that you're allowed to say and not allowed to say? Yeah. It's kind of our frustration with social media, right? They're constantly moving the goalposts. So these people are movers and shakers. They're really powerful when they decide let's get advertisers off Twitter, they succeed. They got McDonald's, they, they, they got, got Microsoft, yeah, they, they got, got everybody off of them. I think when Musk took bought Twitter, 
they coordinated to have 80% of ads advertisers drop their ads off. Of and and they did this behind the scenes. So at the yeah. time it seemed like, oh man, there really is this big organic movement to not advertise on Twitter. Mm-hmm. And then as we reported, you know, maybe a month ago, it was discovered, oh, this wasn't actually organic at all. It was Garm pulling the strings. Coordinated yeah. antitrust monopoly behavior. Mm-hmm. It's illegal. Yeah. You can't do that. And that takes us to what we're about to mention mm-hmm. and Elon's reaction. Right. Yeah. yeah. So he had Linda Yaccarino, who's the CEO, CEO of, X. of X, came out and basically declared war on Garm. Yeah. And you can, yeah. you can watch her post they, yourself. Yeah. They, la- they are launching cool. class uh, action lawsuit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Antitrust lawsuit. Oh yeah. Rather it, not class action. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Antitrust lawsuit, which the response just came across our desk. It's literally today we're recording this on August 8th. Yeah. That. They, uh, Garm has disbanded mm-hmm. yep. in so that's, light of this affront from X and Elon. Yeah, now that they're getting any pushback, right. they're immediately disbanding. It's It seems like a good thing, right? I mean, and, and it is it's too early thing. to tell, really, if it's going to be an undiluted good or not. Well, but I think tactical, it's a diluted good. A tactical retreat. Exactly. Yeah. I think uh, they're saying, yeah. okay, there's any kind of pushback. We're going we're gonna to just let this front collapse. We're going to maintain our resources, pull them away reformat somewhere else and then keep pushing the same agenda. Well, the, the, yeah. And I, I, not that I'm disagreeing with that, but I think that this is a massive blow and it's been coming because of think of all the things, just let's look five years ago, all this terms that nobody was, or very few people were very familiar with, or even understood most of them acronyms yeah, like DEI. Right. I remember or, the first time or, that came up here in at the Patriot Post. Yeah, or ESG. People, mm-hmm. Most people are like, what? What is this stuff? And now we have GARM. What we're seeing is, in one sense, the onion is being peeled back. And now what's being exposed is all the inner workings of the, the manipulation machine that the globalists have tr- kind of put together to try to control narrative, control the direction of culture, the control, the where money's being spent and goes, all these are, are ways of manipulating everything. And now what we're seeing is we're seeing this operation. We're, we're seeing it uncovered. Yeah. So I think in one sense, yes, they're, they're, it's not that they're giving up right. and saying, oh, okay, sorry, we won't you do got this anymore. Us. I think what it is, is they're scrambling, they're on defense. And it's a lot easier to see now because we're, so many people are now hip to the game. I guess I would put it this yeah. way. Yeah, look, I don't take marching orders from the man behind the curtain. So it's going to be a lot harder to try to play the same kind of create something with all these nice titles or words in the title and use this language that's very unclear. It sounds good, but nobody really knows what it does. And we present that to the public. And so nobody is... Yeah, and when you have a sterling track record, you can get away with that. And people are like, oh, okay, you're trustworthy people. We'll we'll go along with this because there's no reason not to trust you. Well, increasingly, there's reason not to trust them because the the mask keeps slipping. But the reason I view this as kind of a a diluted good, the fact that they're disbanding, is because they were— they were due for an ass whooping. Yeah, <laughs> and they were going to get it. Yeah. I think yeah. legally, and they're they're doing everything they can well, to avoid that. Y- yeah, but I don't know. I I don't necessarily think just because you disband, because actually X's lawsuit isn't directly against Garm. It's actually against WFA. Oh, that's good. So okay. it's still going on. It's yeah. not like. I mean, they can say, well, we disbanded this thing. Well, are you admitting that you were doing this then? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's, the, I would say likely. Ho- hopefully, X will be able to make this stick regardless of what, what they try to do. Yeah. I mean, I think they've got a great case in that they've got the evidence. And since I think it was about three weeks ago or a little, little bit more, was when the Judiciary Committee had the hearings mm-hmm. and, and they had their what, 39 page report on GARM. Yeah. And exposing all this, and it was after that that I think Musk became and X became much more privy to what all the different things that were going on in relation to Carmen WFA. After that, then they come out and say, okay, I, I mean, they, I'm sure they talked with their lawyers and everything, figured out, okay, we can actually go after him now because we've yeah. got stuff on, on record. So you're doing a really good job explaining the details here, but I want to yeah. back up a little bit and kind of get more of the structure of this. So- 
what happened was Elon buys X. Yeah. And then he says, I'm a free speech absolutist, or he'd already said that, and basically starts allowing people to say pretty much whatever they want on X and report the truth is what's largely happening is you're actually seeing reports of the truth. And so Garm then reacted against that. And then what we're really kind of seeing is that that acquisition of X really, really was important. And in, in some ways, Elon is the champion of free speech at the moment. Yeah. Because there's some other things happening right now that we're going to be getting to where you, you're not hearing about them from the corporate media. You're not hearing about it from politicians, but you are hearing about it on X because X is a place where free speech can be. And you're hearing about it on the pop culture contrarian, <laughs> which is also on X. And we doubled down when Elon took the reins because oh, yeah. we could actually say whatever we wanted. The Patriot Post is on X mm -hmm. in, in particular. So follow the Patriot Post while you're at it. If you are not subscribed, go ahead and subscribe on YouTube. Click that bell notifications button. If you're on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, go ahead and subscribe, download, leave us a review. Yeah. We really appreciate. Leave us some comments on our YouTube video. Yep. However, you can you can boost our engagement. It, it's really helpful for us. Indeed. But yeah, pay special attention to X because we like X. Yes, that's that's true. That's where we, I think, probably think the future is. So yeah, there's there's stuff being reported on X that you're not seeing anywhere else right now. And that stuff specifically has to do with Basically, England is tearing itself apart at the moment. And I say England specifically, I think it's kind of across the UK, but it's it's mainly in the nation of England within the UK, which is, there was a stabbing, a, a terrible stabbing, and the culprit has not been fully identified. And so finally, these, these native Englishmen seem to have had enough. And so they're taken to the streets in large numbers, and they're being accused of being far right or extremist right or racist or whatever. But all they're really saying is this is not as an, an Islamic country because that's what they're primarily opposed to. This is, as they say in their speeches, a Christian country that's debatable maybe, but at least founded as such. Right. And it's a country that has been Christian for, you know, over a thousand years, certainly. And where the, the King literally holds a role in the church of England. So yeah. It's it's pretty darn Christian. Talk about Christian nationalism. That's the definition. <laughs> <laughs> For real. So th what they're saying is basically, we don't want this nation to become just like Iraq, where they're, uh, this is just something I'm throwing in. Iraq is trying to lower the age where girls can be married from, I think it was 13 down to nine years old. And they're saying, we don't want that here. That's That's not how we want women in England to be treated. And there's that, and there's all these stabbings and rapes and, and killings and all these horrible things that have been happening to English women by, by immigrants. And so it's only being reported on as, as far right racism basically, but that's, that's not what's happening. It's just English people saying, Hey, I'm English and I want this place to remain England. So that kind of gets us to the second part of our title, the West's Islam problem. Indeed. Because this is something that's, that's taking place across the West. Oh. I think one of y'all who, who spotted the Austria thing? I did. Okay. Yeah. So it was the Taylor Swift concert. Yeah. And it was threatened by ISIS. More than threatened, I think. Yeah. It was Yeah, like there was a plot. To, and and they had they, they had bomb conspirators them. who had been hired as guards. Yeah. Right. And so they ended up having to cancel her concert tour in Austria. And this was ISIS. Yeah. Who was behind it. And this was going to be another October seven. That's what they it were trying to do. It was an Austrian October seven. Yeah. They because if you don't remember on October seventh, there was a music concert going on. The, the Hamas paratroopers or paragliders paraglided in and massacred all these, you know, probably more left than, than center or right kids who were just there to enjoy some music. And, and Hamas gloated about it and celebrated it and viewed it as a huge, fantastic thing that they had done. And they were trying to do this again in Austria at a Taylor Swift concert. And luckily they were foiled. Yes. Yeah. This is a clash of cultures. It's not just a clash of religious perspectives, mm -hmm. but a class of cultures. And the West, Europe, is historically Christian. It, mm -hmm. the, the modern Europe we know was formed by Christianity. Yeah. I mean, there's everybody who knows history recognizes that reality. And in fact, Europe, Christian Europe, and the Middle East have had, have long had conflict. So historically, we have the Crusades, right? Yeah. And the Crusades were fought... I mean, over the Holy Land, but it was really, it was Christian Europe 
against Islam, the Islamic Middle East. And, you know, the Crusades, a lot's been said about them, but the very origin of them, at least the first one in Europe, from the European's perspective, was these pilgrims were going to the Holy Land and were being mistreated. That was the original, yeah. that's why they cried foul and they, they initiated this whole ordeal that, yeah. you know, a lot happened. It was a long period of history. Yeah, so you have a class of cultures, and the reason it's so bad in Europe right now is because of the mass migration of people from the Islamic world, from mm -hmm. the Middle East. And um, and it's fleeing it's, war. A lot of them legitimately. I mean, you could. Who wants to be in Syria during the middle of a civil war? Yeah, fair, but yeah. you don't just because you're from Syria and it's in the middle of a civil war doesn't mean you get to move into my hometown. True. And so there, but it's been abused. I, yeah. I would put it that way. And when, when you're in, this is, this debate goes bigger than just Islam. This is a mm -hmm. debate that goes to the heart of the whole concept of immigration. When you're coming from one culture into another culture and you're leaving your home culture, as it were, because of whatever reason, you, it, it's, it's dangerous for you. You can't survive it, whatever. And you're coming into a new culture. The attitude used to be, you need to assimilate into that new culture. Right. If you're, if, if, if you're that desperate and this culture you're judging is better or safer for me, I need to be integrated into it. And that was the whole concept behind America. Right. And, and, and like Ellis Island specifically, yeah. when you came to Ellis Island, if you had a name Americans would have trouble with, you changed it. Yeah. There was that. Um, there was also, if you came to Ellis Island and you were sick, guess what? You stayed there until either you got better or they decided you're not and they would send you back. Right. So, I mean, in our world today, that would be like, oh, that's too harsh. It's too mm -hmm. judgmental. Well, the fact of the matter is you're not owed an immigrant or someone seeking to immigrate into another country doesn't have a right to that just because they want to. Right. But that has what has been communicated to a whole generation now of, of folks in Europe, mm -hmm. or at least by their leaders, yeah. and folks here by our leaders. I mean, and and there is a suspicious connection between the leaders who are the most pro-immigration in Western countries: Justin Trudeau, probably Keir Starmer. I don't know that for sure, but I know some of the leaders in the Netherlands, which have had similar problems, between those leaders and between. The World Economic Forum. Ah, there it <laughs> yeah. is. This Evil. Th these people really, you know, they, they the World Economic Forum, Forum really does push immigration. It pushes multiculturalism. It pushes a one world government, basically, is what they ultimately want. You know what's ironic about them pushing multiculturalism, or just in, in general, to mm -hmm. me that I, I find interesting when they talk about this, is they never mean it. Right. Mm. They're, you know, like when they talk about, let's talk about being, we want a safe place for everyone. That's why you're not allowed to come in because you got bad ideas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what? That's true. Yep. It, I've, I've always found this argument just, it's the, it's worded in, it's like we said with Garm and all this, it's worded in such a fashion that it sounds positive. Mm -hmm. Like when they say multiculturalism, it's like, hey, everyone likes to experience aspects of other cultures like yeah. their food or or I mean, their their art or things like that. And so when people hear that, they're like, yeah, that's great. We want that. Yeah. That's not what actual multiculturalism is because every culture has a value system. Yeah. And you can't have cultures with value systems that are actually the antithesis of one another and say, oh, they're all going to mold together and get along. Yeah. You can't have multiculturalism, at least not for a long time, what ends up happening is you have one culture that ascends to dominance yeah. and other ones die or are chased away or, or whatever. Yeah. What you can have, as America has done in the past, have a very robust, healthy, accepting culture that people from other cultures integrate into. And then the parts of their home culture that can be integrated into mm -hmm. it, those parts can be integrated in, right. but not the whole thing. That's why it's called the melting pot. Right. Yeah. Right. There's it's not called the individual pots. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, you know, when, when people from China move here and they bring Chinese lanterns and architecture and ornamentation and Chinese food, all that's wonderful. And that is, that totally fits just fine. Right. But that's, you can't yeah. bring in the CCP. <laughs> <laughs> Precisely. You know, that is why I have such a pet peeve about this notion of cultural appropriation. Cause that like the foundation 
And the cool exceptionalism of America mm-hmm. is that we are a melting pot, but in order to do that, you have to share. Yeah. yeah. And we, yeah. Ha- we, we, uh, we have appropriated positively a bunch of different things from different cultures because literally people from all over the world have come here and become Americans. And, and historically the most successful cultures have exported their culture yeah. widely and been like, yeah. here's my culture. Enjoy it. We have, you can go, you can go anywhere in the world and buy a Coca-Cola or a pair of blue jeans yep. or Jack Daniels whiskey hey. or watch a TV yeah, or watch a movie. Listen to rock and roll music. I can't guess you guys aren't ready for that yet. Talk on a telephone. Yeah. These are all <laughs> things that. America gifted to the world. Yeah, well, America, yeah, I, gifted's fine. I would use a different word <laughs> okay. if I could think of it. But yeah. <laughs> Introduced. We anyhow. didn't give it all away is what no, I'm saying. No, no, that's true. We yeah. shared it. And you get a car. And you get a car. <laughs> we, we made should. a profit, but there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> yeah. We influenced the yeah. world, and that's the, this influence. But the influence wasn't because what America did was it unlocked the ability of of the individual because he's free mm. to use his talent and his thoughts and his creativity to, to build and, and to create and to discover and to develop all these wonderful things that we enjoy in the modern world. Mm-hmm. And, and that's what it used to be. You immigrated to the U.S. because you saw what the U.S. had and you wanted a piece of that for yourself. Yeah, you weren't stuck on a lower caste because you were born in a lower part of society. Right. And... And that's not what we're seeing today. In in Minnesota, uh, in Minneapolis, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Plus Minnesota. <laughs> okay. Just yeah. making sure I didn't have that wrong. Right state. In yes. Minneapolis, it's the first major city in the U.S. to have done this. They've been doing it for about a year. I don't know why I saw it recently, but they play the Adhan, the Muslim call to prayer, five times a day over city property, I think, in the city of Minneapolis, in, you know, the Great Lakes region. That's not, that's not coming to America and seeing... What America has and being like, oh, I like that. Let's let's be Americans. That's coming to America and being like, you know what? Let's change it to what Iraq is like because I like Iraq better than I like Minneapolis. Yeah, yeah. I mean that this is that clash of, class clash of cultures again. Sounds like a video game it, it, on your mobile device. <laughs> clash of cultures. <laughs> it is, and the culture we have enjoyed in the United States and our First Amendment says you have freedom of religion mm-hmm. then we've 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 battled long and hard for generations on how that actually works itself out in the public square can the government like can someone can a congressman stand up and pray before a session of congress or something like that can Where, the 10 commandments be in schools can the 10 commandments right. be in schools so these are questions that we've wrestled with continuously and now you've now we've introduced another competing religion that doesn't historically it it doesn't recognize the separation of church and state. That's no. not that's not something that Islam has ever valued. It has occurred in places. You have you have like historically and you could say that technically like Turkey is a secular Islamic state. So you you could say that. It's yeah. a mili- militarist Islamic state maybe. Yeah. But it makes some interesting firearms for sure. Yeah. yeah. So the the, tr- the the thing is Islam's laws, Sharia law is doesn't does not meld into our constitution well they, they, at all. yeah you can't you can't meld sharia with equal rights for men and women you just, yeah. it can't be done yeah and that's what we're seeing that's what the english have been seeing that's what the french have been seeing that's what we're starting to yeah. see in america and we actually saw something you know there's a caveat here but we saw with the recent vice presidential pick for kamala harris at least in the rhetoric around some of the the potential candidates we saw that that these people don't believe in a free society uh, and so so I'll explain that a little bit so Kamala Harris is wildly left wing and she's beholden to her left wing base good chunk of which happen to be muslim because that's the alliance they've made not because there's any unity between those positions and one of the candidates for her vice presidential pick was Josh Shapiro from Pennsylvania, which is a swing state. Yeah, it's a state she governor, has to win. Governor of Pennsylvania. What did I say? No, you said he's from okay, Pennsylvania. Yeah. He's the governor of the yeah, state. The governor of, of Pennsylvania. It's a critical state for both Trump or Kamala if they're trying to win. And 
the rhetoric was that he's genocide Josh because he is a he is a Jew, Josh Shapiro, and he had previously written an essay 30 years ago saying that the the Palestinians and Hamas specifically do not want a two state solution, which is true. True, and demonstrably, the, the, the Palestinians Hamas didn't exist 30 years ago, but yes, okay, Palestinians. Yeah, well, the the people who became Hamas, I suppose. Yeah, and that's just. That's just true. They do not want a two-state solution. They want the eradication of Israel. And, and so that's what he said. And so the fear was on the left, if Kamala chooses Josh Shapiro, they won't win the Muslim vote because he's a Jew and because he supports Israel. Literally and, anti-Semitism chose the VP pick. <laughs> right, right. And so she ended up choosing Tim Walls, who I actually think maybe Shapiro turned her down because he thinks he has political legs left. But could be true. At the very least, he w- that was a mark against him from her perspective was that he was Jewish and had previously supported Israel, and that's just that's just not right. And so what we're seeing is that in America, in France, in in England, in the rest of Europe, Islam is not playing well with these Western values, and it doesn't intend to. Meanwhile, there also seems to be another, I guess, another piece in play, and that is the reaction of leftist Marxist secularism Mm. on the state. And I noticed that throughout the the Muslim situation in the UK or in um, England, all the riots that are going on right now, and particularly the issue of free speech. Yeah. They're jailing people (laughs) for sharing their opinions about the riots going on. On Facebook. Mm -hmm. Yeah, between Muslims essentially, and nationals, you know, right. British nationals. Yeah, that's an example of a clash of cultures. You have one culture that doesn't, you know, doesn't believe in free speech, not to the extent that we in the West in value free speech. And historically, our concept of free speech grows out of our English roots. Yep. And so, I mean, I think of the, the, the Charlie Hebdo slaughter that happened after, you know, in France. Because of a cartoon. Because of a cartoon, because according to the Islamic rules, you don't, it's, it's, I don't know how they put it. It's a major sin, I guess. You, you can't, you can't make a representation Muhammad. of Muhammad. Make, yeah. yeah. It doesn't matter. Just, you're not allowed to do it. If you do, it's, it's, yeah, you can get. Well, clearly that was a Muslim t- action you know, yeah. taken by vigilantes, but, or some form, I guess it was. Well, what I'm saying. It's not co-opted by the state. My point is mm-hmm. that. This free speech situation, yes. So, oh, I see what you're saying. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. The free speech. And so, yes, Thomas, that is a s- similar example of the clash of cultures we're talking yeah. about. But I just find it very interesting that in the, this particular instance where people are being jailed by the state yeah. for their speech, speaking out against this stuff, it's being initiated by the state, supposedly from people who have Western values and ideas, a Western yeah. value, Western um, legal system. Yeah. Well, I think what it is, is this is what you end up when you go down the rabbit hole of woke so far yeah. that you are, you buy into the narrative that the real enemy is the West. That's exactly right. Yeah. Either yeah. It, it's, it's, Manifold it's, it's, things going it's, on here, but the, it's, the West is the most racist, bigoted, oppressive, and and system effectively is the narrative from the woke, right? And racism is the worst thing you can do, right? And so that's why they even conflate Islam with race, yeah. which is ridiculous. They say if you're Islamophobic, you're racist. Somehow. Yeah, the vast majority of Muslims aren't going out killing people or hurting people. That is that is also true. Yeah, and the truth is, the vast majority of people who have been killed by radical Islam are Muslims. Muslims. That's also true. So I'm just saying that the value system here is what the real, right now, the reason this is being allowed to happen in England is because this leftist worldview has taken over so much, at least in England, this woke worldview, that it is basically saying, it's basically a neo-Marxism. Let's just be honest. And so what they're saying is, these are the oppressed groups Islam, the, mm-hmm. the, the minorities. These these Islamic immigrants who have set up shop yeah. in the UK and now run whole neighborhoods basically it, by it, Sharia. It doesn't matter. They're, they're the oppressed. Yeah, exactly. Okay, they've been classified that way. They're, ergo, the the native English or UK, you know, Brits, mm-hmm. they're historically the oppressor group. 
And so it, it the dynamics are always going to be judged in that fashion. So, right. And since racism under their definition has to do with power dynamics, yeah. anything a, a white British person says that's, that's not pro more immigration and pro more Islamic colonization of the UK is racism. And, and basically, you know, I'm sure they'll get to the point where anything you say along those lines, they're going to come arrest you for that because, because they're doing it. Well, that's why it's going so far, but it, what, what it will be telling is how will the British put up with this? Yeah. Well, these protests have been going on for a few days now and there's seemingly still going, but you, you're not hearing about it on, from the corporate media. No, you're not hearing about it because if you were to hear about it, it breaks the narrative. Yeah. And I think that's that's what'll be interesting to see is how long can they keep this this teapot, you know, boiling at it as it is without it, you know, getting hotter. And it seems like it's getting hotter. Yeah. It's getting hotter. We're being baked alive. Unfortunately, I mean this is an innocence just not it's just not the UK. I think France and other places have been having this problem. And as we said, Austria, Sweden has had a lot of this issue. Yeah. This is, yeah. Some of those Scandinavian countries came out and said, Hey, we were wrong about immigration. Yeah. It's, it's, it'll, this is what every, this is what the, I, I've, I've heard people worry about like what happens when, in the, when the right goes woke, as it were, mm -hmm. is the saying, in, in other words, what happens when all of a sudden this identity politics, the way it's being played, if, it, if, if the right actually fully embraces it, then it's going to backlash the other direction. And that's the thing that everybody's worried about is if you go that direction, then we're going to start seeing people who come back and say, well, if we're going to play this game where it's the, the, that it's culture against culture or it's identity group against identity group. Then we're going to play that game and we're going to do what you've seen throughout history when people have played that game yeah. and what you've seen is cultures killing one another. Yeah. It's war. And that's not what we want, but, yeah. but it's, it's what seemingly these, these WEF people are, are driving for. If you judge them by the results of their actions. I think what they're, I, I just think that they don't really know what they're doing. Honestly, yeah. I think that's, that's part that's you have, when you have a worldview that you believe is true and right and everything, you're not forced to question it until it really fails. Yeah. And well, and the more bought in you are, the harder it is yeah. to to break yourself free from it. It's That's like true. if you've ever watched any of these like shows about these d various cults that develop, it can if people get into it deep enough, it, it it's hard for them to be able to see straight. Yeah, and I think as much as we think, okay, you know, we like we say the cabal of the the WEF and everything. Yeah, World Economic Forum. Yeah, in one sense, they've bought into this narrative of this is where progress for the world must go. And that's what it looks like. I think a lot of these people are, are more aware of what they're doing than that. I think they're like, we stir up enough trouble, enough chaos in enough places. We can get even more power. And then our yard will continue to be patrolled by our own security. And none of this will ever affect us. And our kids will, you know, rule the world after us. And I think some, a good number of these people are just, after power and, and they see they can, they can keep gaining power if they keep pushing this rule of power yeah. over rule I, of man. I would law. say that the, man, man, the minority right. in that position, kind of like you're saying the minority. Yeah. I think there's minority figures or minority groups that are definitely there. And we don't mean minority the way the, the woke mean it. A no. small group. Yes. I think Actual that definition. Yeah. The, the broader culture believers in the progressive movement, actually believe it. Yeah. I, I think that's, that's also true. You know, it's well, they're being manipulated. Yeah. Yeah. They're clearly. Yeah. Well, that was a fun episode, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, isn't that exciting? The good news is though, Elon did buy X and it is actually having a massive impact on the way these things play out. Uh, as we, as we mentioned, Garm had to shut down basically because they got outed and, and the next thing that they try to do, that'll get outed too. And, and, They'll have to move on and move on. And eventually they'll have no credibility credibility left. What is the, who said the pen is mightier than the sword? I, Shakespeare. Was it Shakespeare? More than likely. <laughs> it's, it's hardly ever wrong to attribute something to yeah, Shakespeare. Yeah, I, I mean, but it's, that's the whole concept of free speech being, you know, f the truth coming out is, is 
de- always will eventually defeats the lie. Yeah, exactly. And uh, you it, know. it may get really, really dark before the dawn, but we, we do believe the dawn is coming. Ultimately, you know, as Christians, we believe that, but also just looking at the world around us, we, we, I think we have hope that the truth yeah. is going to defeat these pernicious lies. Yeah. And you know, the, the challenge is to stand for the truth, even when it's not popular. Yeah. So allegedly the pen is the mighty, the pen is mightier than the sword is attributed to Edward Bulwer Lytton from 1839. I see. Okay. So that's well after Shakespeare. Yeah. I just pulled that out of nothing. Well, you know, <laughs> I you just, can, if it's witty, you attribute it to. I attribute it to Indiana Jones because <laughs> well, that's where I heard it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Brilliant. All right. Well, despite, you know, the, the tone, as we've said, we do believe there's hope. We think, we think this is going to be defeated. It's, It might get uglier before it gets better, but it's going to get better, we hope. Yeah, and as Uh, Christians, we're called to love our neighbors and our enemies. That's true. Um, That's always the the challenge. But you 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 don't lie to them either, right? You don't lie to them either. Yeah, and you you defend the weak as well. Certainly, Uh, it's right to defend the weak. All right. Well, (laughs) that's our episode on the assault on free speech and the West's Islam problem. I guess we'll see you next time. Uh, We're brought to you by the Patriot Post, as we've said during this episode, which is the oldest conservative news digest on the web. It's right and it's free. Be sure to like and subscribe. And be sure to like and subscribe to the Pop Culture Contrarian on Spotify, iTunes, X, YouTube, Rumble, wherever you want to find us. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. See ya.